I want to describe the relationship and the distinctions between the existentialists and the postmodernists. So, on the on the first hand, we have the existentialists who came before the postmodernists, and I'm speaking of Sartre, Heidegger, Merleau, Ponty, Buber, and Camus. Those are the existentialists with which I am most familiar. And of course, yeah, the big names Sartre, or Camus. I mean, these are these are household names and the foundational existential theorists. And what they are out to do is I'll give you a phrase that Sartre used. It's very condensed. There's a very condensed way of describing what existentialism is, and that's what Sartre describes it as. as. He says, existence precedes essence. And what that means is that when we look at the world, we always see it in terms of things which might be labeled. We see a tree, and we call it a tree. Um, we we look around the world and we're always labeling the things we find there. And what Sartre is suggesting is that the thing which we label is already there before we label it. So it's essentially an inversion of the platonic world of forms where Plato thought that the most abstract truths, the most abstract truths are the most real things. So the whole world of things which we experience and the whole world of appearances, that's all fake. That's all secondary uh, to Plato. And he says that, he would say that essence precedes existence. It's these, these a priori world of forms that exist. And that's upon that world, all of the world of appearance that we actually encounter depends. So Sartre takes that and inverts it. He says, no. Um, we start with existence. So when we look at things, it's not as though they are embodiments. They're not manifestations of a of an eternal form. You know, when I look at a tree, I don't recognize it as a tree because there's some there's a, a literal heaven above with a concept of a perfect tree. And that, that concept is manifesting itself in this particular scenario. Um Sartre would say, No, no, no. That's just a label you put on it afterwards. And if you can get out of the trap of words if you can sit aside labels and just look at things they are terrifying that to look at things without labels is to be drawn into them and you're forced to recognize your own existence compare that to say uh martin buber and his idea is that we have two modes of relation. We have the I-it relation and we have the I-thou relation. So the I-it relation is the, is the kind of relation we have with objects. So when I walk around the world, I see, you know, things that I can interact with. I can let that, they essentially are their label. They're, they're, they are all, all a chair is, is what I can do with it, you know. Uh, whereas for Buber, there's this other way of relating, which is the I-thou. And that's the relationship that we have with other people, when we stare into someone else's eyes. And we realize that they are self-conscious in exactly the way that we are. And this, that's this two souls gazing at each other, is Buber. And that's the I-thou relation. It's distinct from the I-it relation. So if we look at Sartre and Buber, essentially Buber... His I it is the same as Sartre's essence, and Buber's I thou is the same as Sartre's existence. So there's both of them, both Sartre and Buber, are trying to find descriptions where we can try and get out of this trap of words. They're trying to describe uh, two different modes of existence one wherein we objectify, one wherein we extract essences. Um, and we try and we, we extract from our experience of reality something which we try and justify as being more real. But for both Buba and Sartre, the more basic and the more real thing is the thou or the, the existence. It's the thing, bef it's 
the tree before we call it a tree. And that theme, that theme of trying to address things outside the realm of words, is is the essential essence of existentialism. Now let's contrast that to postmodernism. Um, and what we have there is I would res I would explain I would describe as an I it or an essence based philosophy. It's closed again. It's closed the door which existentialism opened. And existentialism, the existentialists encouraged us to as Camus says, live to the point of tears. To stare so to stare at the world without presumption and to look at it and to just experience it. The postmodernists, on the other hand, were more interested in uncovering assumptions within other people's philosophy. So where Sartre looks at a tree and would think to himself, hmm, I think of this as a tree, but if I, for the time being, discard my label, I can stare at it, and I can see what this thing before me really is. And I have no words, because the words would always prevent me from seeing it. The word, to, to try and describe it in words is to put a blindfold on. Contrast that. What Foucault might say when staring at a tree. He could think, this is a tree. But what is a tree? And who came up with the idea of a tree? And what is the history of the term tree? And what are some of the greater assumptions that are baked into this notion of tree? Tree is a part of nature. And nature is a concept. A concept which has been probed philosophically for thousands of years. So, wrapped up in my perception of this tree is this whole network of beliefs and ideals and historical after effects. And that's that's what Foucault was interested in. He was interested in unearthing what we bring to the world. And that's pretty characteristic of the postmodernists in general. What they were out to do was to unearth what we bring to the world. Whereas the existentialists, they were out to look at the world. They weren't bothered with the nature of our blindfold, so to speak. If existence precedes essence, and all words are a, of a covering, they cover reality. And the existentialists were motivated purely by the motivation, by the goal of seeing reality as it is. The postmodernists wanted to unearth all the presumptions hidden within uh, the essence which we ascribe to the world. And what amounts from that postmodern attitude, where instead of looking and listening to the world, and just letting go of words and being silent, and allowing the world to come to you, we have to tear ourselves apart, we have to rip into ourselves. An effect of that is that something is smuggled in, and that that is this notion of being a blank slate. Because with the existentialists, uh, maybe someone like Sartre, or maybe many of them were prone to to this sort of blank slateism, this feeling that we are not determined by anything, that we have no constraints. But ultimately, existentialism doesn't require that we be blank slates. We can be uh, very much sketched in slates and still be radically free. So, in the same way that wherever I am, I have a world about me. There are things in the world. I live in a context. There's always participating in a game. It's as though I have woken in a dream and there's a world of action and, and narratives and storylines and, and people and, and beliefs and desires. There's a whole living world out there. And 
that the existentialists refer to this as one's facticity, uh, and that would be the world in which one finds oneself. Uh, so you might say, you know, I'm a wherever you are, you might be a, a poor person who has been born with, who has made it, made his way into, say, a medical school and, and has a life plan now to become a doctor. So his facticity is determining his actions. He might say, because I was born to poverty and because I was granted the opportunity to become someone who can escape poverty, I am bound by duty to become that. But ultimately what Sartre would say is that this is living within the confines of facticity. It's ignoring a greater part of ourselves, which is no matter what situation we find ourselves in, and no matter how clear our path forward is, the reality is that we can choose. We can always choose. So even if you're that medical student, he might feel that he has no options. He might feel, even if he hated medicine, he might think, there's simply no way that I can I can avoid this. This is just my lot. It's my cross to bear. Sartre would of course say that it doesn't that at any time we think the decision has been made for us, we are deceiving ourselves. Because we have to choose to live by our principles or our commitments. So we're never truly bound by anything. And I posit that biological uh, predisposition is just another part of our facticity. Sartre would already accept that the fact that we have to eat and the fact that we are in these human bodies is a part of facticity. We find ourselves in a world in which we are a conscious mind in a in a body, and in a particular body, a human body, and then in a human body of a particular sex and particular size and shape and colour and all these things. But despite the, that, we still have the choice to operate our bodies in any way we see fit. And it may be the case that the type of body into which we're born determine and limit our actions. You know, um, Sartre surely couldn't run as fast as uh, Bolt. But both Sartre and Usain Bolt were free to run in any direction they chose. So while there is a real world out there which constrains us in a sense, those constraints still don't limit our choice. We still have an infinite realm of choices within the constraints of our facticity. So if I come to the world with um, a, a biological sex and the corresponding gender identity, for instance, that it becomes a part of my facticity. So the existentialist approach to that understanding of my, my, my body being of a certain sex and my mind being uh, of a certain gender identity, it's, it's that I can choose. The existentialist would say, yes, these things are true. And you may be able to come up with valid reasons for why there are differences in the behaviors based on, based on these biological characteristics. But at the end of the day, you're still free to choose. You're always free. You're always free. So it doesn't matter that there is a real biological explanation for a gender difference, because we're still evidently always free to act in accordance with a different gender. But that doesn't mean that those things aren't true. So with the postmodernists, because they they were thinking largely in the wake of the existentialists, they came after. Postmodernists were they had at the forefront of their minds this notion of radical freedom, that were there free to choose, but because the postmodernists neglected the realization which defined the existentialist, the realization that existence precedes essence, that words will never capture what it is, existence. Words will never capture existence. They always cover it up. Because the postmodernists didn't realize that, 
they had to repurpose the notion of radical freedom. Radical freedom in a world where there is no outside text means something very different than radical freedom in a world defined by being perpetually outside the text. So the existentialists thought that they saw that we were, the existentialists recognized that we were born into a world and that that world constrains us in many ways, but that as conscious beings we have always the choice to act in accordance or to determine the direction of our actions despite uh, what limitations there might be. At the end of the day we're all walking through the woods and we have to pick our path and we, we frequently justify that no there is only one way we ought to go. We have to go that way. But of course because existence precedes essence there cannot be any such limitation, any such determination of choice. There is a fact there is a factical world out there and we have to choose how to live in it. Now when we don't recognize um, the world outside of the text and we think that we're radically free, all that can mean is that we must be radically free from determination. So if you can't see that the freedom lies in the fact that all theorizing and description is after the fact, if you can't recognize that that's where freedom comes from, then it must be that freedom comes from the world itself. The actual factical world is one of radical freedom. And that's something which I can't countenance, because I feel that we do live in a, there is a, we must pay attention to the reality in which we find ourselves. And I think the existentialist had it right, that obviously the factical situation into which we're thrown uh, informs who we are and it informs how we act. But at the moment of realization, the existential realization that whoever I think I am is something which I have created it's then we gain freedom I think they had that right with the notion of radical freedom that no matter how how determined we might be by the situation we're in and a scientist may well be able to study human behavior as though we're animals as though we're push button machines and predict where we might go. At any choice, we still have to, at any moment, we still have to choose to go down that path, to go down the path which seems obvious. So we have now the postmodernists with a smuggled in blank slatism. They smuggled in blank slatism through the existentialists. And they believe in a radical freedom and that there is no outside text, which means that we must become free from our... Because the, the postmodernists can't see what the existentialists saw, they, they need to find it. They try and find what the existentialists had in theory. So where the existentialists realized that Theory was the problem. Existence happens before theory. Theory is a matter of uh, weighing and analyzing and comparing different types of essence. Theory is a matter of the I-it relation. Because they forgot the I-thou, the existence which precedes essence, the absurd, as Camus puts it, because they ignored that. They tried to find, in theory, that radical freedom. That ability to... And that is the, that is the seed of the deconstructive idea of Derrida. Because if we can't escape 
the constraints of identity and of the limitations we place upon ourselves by recognizing the fact of our existence, then we must escape the condemnation of our facticity by drilling in to that facticity. We have to prevent the world from conditioning us. And so the existing so the postmodernists spent their time drilling down into all the things which condition our identity and our experience. But all the while there is in the background this missing appreciation for existence as such. And I think that that lack, a corresponding to the existentialist notion of radical freedom, is radical responsibility. Because while we're entirely free to choose, far more free than we think we are, dizzyingly free, still what that means is that no one is to blame for my actions. So I'm free to choose whatever I like. And whatever I choose can be ascribed to only myself. The blame for which path I go down is the fault of me and God, perhaps. And what I mean by that is, I mean, perhaps I've been given a pretty awful lot and I have very few choices. I only have a couple of choices and they're each torturously bad. That has happened in the past and it has happened in the world. But People come into a world in which they simply have limited material choices and that all of those choices lead down uh, unpleasant paths. But even if you're born into such a situation, you realize that you have, you have choice. You still have some way of directing your actions and directing your attitude to your to the world you find yourself in and that you must there's no one left to take responsibility maybe you could blame god for putting you in such a horrible situation and for limiting your choices but at the end of the day if you believe that if you spend your time blaming god for so condemning you you're forgetting to realize that you have to choose to see the world. You have to choose to interpret the world in this way, to interpret the world where there is a God who has foisted reality upon you. Now, radical freedom for the postmodernists, because it's just deconstructive, it means that these constraints which we place on existence we are radically free in that we we are free to interpret those constraints in any way which at the end of the day means that those constraints aren't really constraints if we can show them to be arbitrary and dependent on a bunch of a whole lot of other things which uh, contradict each other then we can dismantle our concepts of meaning. So when we stare at the tree and Foucault starts about his process of deconstructing the notion of tree, we have radical freedom. We are radically free in the postmodernist sense that we can dismantle this concept of tree. By doing so we recognize it has no foundation. But where is the room here in postmodern theory for radical responsibility because with the existentialists the radical freedom was complemented by radical responsibility but with postmodernists radical freedom means freedom to deconstruct and interpret but it doesn't mean radical responsibility responsibility perhaps in the sense that we must re that we are responsible to to recognize the arbitrariness of our of our knowledge but not arbit not responsibility for how we end up 
and for the life that we lead. Because if if the project is simply to dismantle meanings, if we think that it's the fault of others for constructing those meanings, if other people constructed meanings, and if meaning, if words get in the way of our radical freedom, then it is the people who constructed those words who are to blame for our for our sense of constraint. And so there's no responsibility like there is with the existentialists. And I think that I think that is underneath a divide which is emerging between those who blame their social conditions and those were born to steer into the abyss.